the Whose Turn Is It Anyway podcast proudly sponsors the 24-Hour Board Game Marathon, a charity event based in Ilminster, Somerset, raising monies for Cots for Tots Bristol, a charity that specialises in helping neonatal babies in intensive care. For more information, look at their website, the 24 Marathon.co.uk, or find them on Facebook. Hi, this is Davey from Who's Turn Is It Anyway. We've got a special episode coming up for you guys. We've got Judson, who designed Deep Regrets, and we're going to have a little chat. Let's get into it. You're here with me, Davey, Adrian, and we've got a guest, Judson. Hello. Um, from Tetix Game. We're going to be talking about Deep Regrets. We're going to first learn... An- a little bit about Judson. So, um, Judson, where 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 did your passion for games come from? Uh, well, first, thanks for having me. It's great to be on the show with you. Uh, passion for games, man, it came early. Like, I, I think probably everybody has the same kind of story where they played something growing up and just got their claws into them and it developed over life. And that's same for me. Grew up playing with, you know, like... The, the big one in the U.S. is Candyland or Cootie or all these little like Milton Bradley games, the game of life, things that are in retrospect, not great games, but <laughs> they, they, they did the, the right thing, which is to get people together to have fun, right? You know, the game is sometimes inconsequential. So, yeah, early love for games that built into a, a greater love for games as I played things later in life. I, I was big into like um, spooky games, as, as you can tell from the my, my own milieu. Um like I have, hang on, I, I'll get it off the shelf to show you on the video. I have this cassette yep. tape. I'll jingle it around oh, for the listeners. Nice. Yeah, uh, there you Shriek go. And Creeks, which was the cassette driven board game where you kind of like went through a haunted house. And this is something that came out like mid 90s. Um, and I still have a copy of it. Uh, and that I absolutely loved that. It was a big inspiration to me when I started working on games. So, like, that was the teens. And then later in life, discovered. Things like Talisman and Battlestar Galactica and kind of got into the, the deep end at that point. The, the classics. I've never seen that cassette. No, I haven't. In my life. <laughs> that's so game. unique. It's a beautiful game. Yeah, can you, um, you could have to send us a photo of that so I can put that on our we'll socials do, yeah, as well. Yeah. Just, to, just to go along with this. That's cool. Um, it's pretty similar to you know where we started as well, uh, game-wise. But design-wise, how did that kind of lead into games design? Did you... Did you have like a little brief period of video games in between or was it just kind of straight into board games and that was your passion? Uh, I, I'm i a really big video gamer too. I'd, I'd say because I can do it on my own more easily, I probably play more video games than board games, but I love both both equally. Um, I had a little bit of a career in the games video games industry doing music. So I did um, I like composed music for a couple of indie games called Rogue Legacy um, which did did pretty well, which was, that was cool. Um, did some like smaller titles, but that was the biggest one. And like the, the moving into designing of board games, I guess, came from the capability side where I could do it on my own. And I love that. Like I, I'm not good at program. If I learned to like code, I could probably make my own video games, but that doesn't really appeal to me. And board games kind of use a lot of the talents I had already like, you know, like the, the systems thinking required to design the actual game, the illustration, the graphic design, all those things. But then also the like marketing skills I have from having worked 20 years in marketing now and like photography skills from, you know, studying photography at uni and that kind of thing. So it just like was this like nice mm, conflagration of all of my skills in one place that I really liked. And um, what's so you talked about, obviously, love for video games and getting to play a lot of it. Do you feel like that influences your board game sort of choices and, and designs or anything like that as to... Well, I mean, the obvious one is <laughs> that Dredge was a big inspiration for um, Deep Regrets. But yeah, yeah, like a lot of my design philosophy, I think, kind of stems out of the video games I play to some degree. I think a lot of the, like, the best inspiration for things comes from other places. Like if you're making video games, don't look at other video games for inspiration. If you're making board games... Don't just look at other board games for inspiration, travel, see the world, do other things. You know, a lot of times, and I think I think people are really good at that in the board game industry. It's where you get games about making sushi or, you know, running a, a, a like, 
a network of pipes in a city. You know, like there's like all kinds of random themes and that comes to life really well. Uh, so video games, of course, inspired it. Like there's a lot of um, games that inspire Deep Regrets that I'm working on now. Uh, I'm a big fan of all the Soulsborne series. So Bloodborne, there's a lot of like creatures in there that kind of look like they came from Bloodborne. Um, yeah. And a lot of Dredge I talked about, but then there's there prior games to Dredge actually, like Sunless Sea, Subnautica. There's all these like horror, sea horror adjacent things. There's one called The Shore, which is like a really indie title about, it's very Lovecraftian. There's all these like sea horror titles that I, I absolutely, that's my favorite genre of horror and horror is my favorite genre of anything. So that's like a, a concentrated, focused Judson, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I rewatched The Lighthouse last week, the uh, the Robert Eggers film in, in preparation for the Kickstarter. You can see the inspiration there. And I do think what's nice about board games now is the inspiration they draw from video games in a lot of mechanics as well as um, style. And you can see the all the bits kind of slot together nicely. It's a unique space and we're, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see where you can go with it. You kind of mentioned that you're a one-man band. Is that true with Tetix? It is. It's it's just me. Tetix Games is, you're looking at him or you're listening to him if you're just dialing in. Um, <laughs> it's, so I, you know, I, I work with a lot of, I have a lot of friends that, that lend me their spare time to like star in the trailer. All those folks, you know, were very generous with their time to do that. A good friend of mine, Connor, came down to UK Games Expo. You guys met him there. He just like helped me run the booth. He's also he's like my biggest cheerleader and fan, and helps me play test and stuff. So like, <laughs> I've got a lot of people that I work very closely with. But like, as far as as far as people that actually really profit from TEDx Games, it's just me at the moment. We'll we'll see if I can maintain things by myself much longer. The scale is getting a little bit unmanageable at the moment. That's that's a good thing. It's it's, it's showing it's yeah. going well at least. Yeah, growing pains. It's good. <laughs> yeah. So what what else in in running it as a one man band? What kind of what do you feel like you get the most out of it being just a one man band? Um creative control I think is the big one for me. And you you talked about how cool the board gaming space is for that in general. That's something that really appeals about it to me is that one person can do it all and you get a lot of like you're not ju- not just myself I'm talking about all creators. Like you get all these like soul creators that are able to come up with a concept from scratch and then see it through to production all by themselves. And that means you get this really focused like vision that is, is, is evident in all aspects of the game. And that's kind of what I go for. Uh, and one of the reasons I like working in isolation, I do, I'm, I'm a really good collaborator. I, I like working with people. And one of the biggest hangups I had about moving into a solo career out of like, cause I worked in the corporate world previously as like a creative director. So I, I ran and managed teams. So I'm very accustomed to, working closely with a lot of people. And that was my biggest fear is that if I left that behind, I would just, my mental health would suffer. I'd be in isolation, but it turns out, um, I still work with about as many people on a daily basis. I think things like this, you know, going to like board game meetups, going to UK games expo, having to work with play testers, working in board games requires you to work with people because you have to play the games with other people. So I, I am not shut up in my house all the time. There's a lot of that, but usually it's focused on doing design work or illustration or something. And, then there's still a lot of collaboration required, surprisingly, for a solo career. It's just like board games. You always have to, you have to be there in person as well. Yep. Designing, it's the same. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so artwork-wise, it's got a very unique style. Is, is that you as well? It is me, yeah. Inspiration, that's the same thing, really? Is that Dredge and... Oh, no, no, no. Um, I didn't really... like So... I, as far as inspiration from dredge, I pulled the like horror fishing genre. Yeah. You know, I, I thought that was such a great concept and it like, it brings the sea horror theme together really nicely. And I wanted to capture that feel, but then I wanted to do something wholly unique outside of that. I didn't want it to be derivative of dredge. I didn't want to just remake that game. So I took that horror fishing concept and tried to do something unique, unique with it. And the illustration style is part of that. I think my illustration style comes from like, um, like my influences are, like cartoons mostly like there's probably a lot of math writing in uh, adventure time adventure time to some degree it's that's a bit more flat and graphic than my style it's like the like, like classy supo animaniacs not say animaniacs sorry um, animations back in the day like um rugrats and ah real monsters do you remember those shows back in the yeah, day i do remember those very yeah. squiggly 
all monolined, outlined with like flat colors in there. Um, the Simpsons, Futurama, Moebius, the, the French artist, Jean Giraud, like he's a big inspiration of mine as well. Um, I'm a big fan. I, I don't, my art doesn't really look like him, but I love Mike Mignola. I'm a big Hell- Hellboy fan. You can probably see some Hellboy on the shelf behind me there. His art style is very different from mine, but I love the way he draws monsters. And I love the way um, uh, Guy Davis, who did BPRD after him, does monsters. He also did all of the creature design for um, the Hellboy films and for um, Pacific Rim, which I wasn't a huge fan of, but the monsters look cool. (laughs) (laughs) You have to kind of turn off your mind with Pacific Rim. It's it's, it's a fun watch, but there's no substance there. Yeah. The monsters are very cool, though. Yeah, Yeah, they are cool. So... Obviously, we've talked about sort of some of the the more like horrific creatures that you've got in Deep <laughs> Regrets. I, I can't imagine. I imagine you got to a certain number and then thought, "I've got to figure out how to get the rest of these art, like these re- the rest of these creatures, and find inspiration." Was there any very odd choices of inspiration for some of these fish? The way you kind of thought, oh, "I didn't think of that," but now this, I've seen something. This is a great question because it, it brings up a really interesting problem I ran into, which is the sea is, is already full of what, – what's the age range for this podcast? Uh, you can swear. Okay, yeah, swear, really yeah. fucked up stuff, man. Like, <laughs> the, especially the deeper you know, areas of the ocean, it gets bizarre down there. So making things that were more terrifying than the reality of the ocean is challenging. And kind of like where I went for that was the Uncanny Valley – so instead of making things look weird, I made them look more human and that becomes more just, you know, it's like that, like it, there's even literally a human that's at the lowest depth in the ocean. And that's probably the most horrifying thing in the game because like, wh- why is there a human down there? <laughs> <laughs> How is he alive and why won't he speak? So that, was, that was the big one, like adding fingers and you know, human eyes and all these sorts of things to, to fish bits and. It's a nice little mishmash of things it becomes pretty disturbing over time. The same with some of the quotes. So we've, I think, myself and Davey, like certainly at the at the demo, we found a lot of the quotes on your cards just absolutely fantastic and <laughs> and very obscure and stuff like that. And it, it it felt like you probably had a lot of fun working out how regretful someone should be over some of these scenarios. Like how regretful should you be about getting an oil spill on your trousers, whereas how regretful should you be of falling overboard and all that kind of stuff? I imagine you had quite a bit of fun with that. And it was good fun. I, I got some help from some friends on that as well. You know, like I wrote up a bunch of them. I was like, what are some other scenarios? One of my favorite, the, the guy Connor I was talking about earlier, he came up with the um, oversalted my breakfast as one of the like trivial. <laughs> <laughs> it cracks me up. Perfect. Love it. Yeah, well, a load of these drawn from experience as well. <laughs> oh, no. um, I made love to a manatee. No, I, I don't really remember. Maybe it's all a little bit of a blur. It was Pandemic one hazy night. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so we kind of broached it a little bit, but Deep Regrets, the game that's currently in Kickstarter campaign. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about it? Uh, so we've we've kind of gone into some of the production aspects of it, but like the game itself is. A horror fishing game, as discussed, for one to five players. So it does have a solo mode that you can kind of co-op with two or three players as well. Um, And it's about spending a week, like the worst week of your life at sea, reeling progressively more and more disturbing things out of the ocean. Um, And as you do this, you'll kind of gather these regret cards, which affect your standing or like where your madness stands. Um, So the more cards you have, the lower you slip into madness or the deeper you slip into madness. And the more mad you are, the more dice you can have and the more valuable the weird fish become and the less valuable the real fish become, um, which is good. But at the end of the game, whoever has the highest values of regrets, which is kind of a hidden number on the back of all your regrets cards at the end of the game, is going to lose the most valuable fish. Um, so there's there's a push your luck mechanic there where you're trying to be crazy, but not the craziest. So mechanically... Can you call a likening to any other games? I, I really struggle with this. I've had people ask me before, mechan- like, what is this game like? And I don't really have a solid answer for that. Um, I'll tell you some things that I, some, some games that I took inspiration from in terms of complexity and mechanics and stuff like that. Um, one of them is Wingspan. Like Elizabeth Hargrave, I just love her design methodology and like her... Um, she obviously has like a an interest in in massive variation, like a, like huge variety, um, and that's important to me. Like the games that I love most, all have a massive variety of of cards or art or whatever it is. So that was like a big thing for me. I want there to be hundreds of fish, and I want them to all be different. Um, 
So I took some inspiration from Wingspan in that regret, in that regard, that regret. I have the word stuck on my, on my tongue <laughs> in that regard. So, um, you know, you're always turning over something new. Like that's, that's what I really like about Wingspan is how like every time you play it, you're going to see some new birds you haven't seen before. And it's really fun to kind of go through. And every time you turn one over, like looking at the details on it, and that's what I wanted to capture with Deep Regrets is that every time you flip over a fish, you never know what it's going to be. And you want to like, fo- like, you know, look at all the details on it, read the flavor text, learn about the fish. Maybe not look too closely, depending on how disturbing <laughs> it is. Um, so that's a big one. Um, I had been playing things like Sagrada. Um, I'm trying to think of other games that do it. The games that have a bunch of dice in them. I wanted to do a game with a bunch of dice. Um, so when I was coming up with like the mechanics for this, I, I kind of put this idea together of using dice as like your strength or your supplies for the day, or you roll a bunch of dice to determine what what supplies and and strength you're taking into the day and then you spend those as the day goes along but like the idea of like because i like opening a box you know of a game and pulling out a bunch of cool components and that was a big thing for me too like i mentioned sagrada it's got all those like beautiful colored dice in it or azul that has all those little tiles you know something with a lot of little uh tactile components i wanted tactile components so that's what i was going for with the buoy dice and and if you haven't seen the game it has little unique four-sided uh buoy dice that's um they resemble like an old wooden buoy or boy sorry boy is the pronunciation here i believe no that they, they, those dice look amazing and they're great to roll as well it's just thematically it's, it's just something really nice about picking up these like little little boys and then just throwing the floats onto the table <laughs> it's just it's really satisfying and i really like that aspect it just fits perfectly with the whole aesthetic of the game so with the design part of it we talked a little bit about some of the joy you've got out of the the production part and doing the artwork and all that lot was there any part of the design process where you kind of just sat back and thought yeah that was i did a good bit of design there was there anything particularly that you've really enjoyed in the game when designing it i really like the shadows on the backs of the fish so so when you're fishing at sea there's nine shoals that you can fish from at three different depths and you just kind of pick one and, and flip the top card over and that's like figuring out what's on your hook basically um and I wanted to be there to be different sizes of fish that were different difficulties to catch. Um, and I wanted to kind of um, forecast that to players, like have them be able to guess at what a fish, was, like the size of a fish was going to be when they flipped it over. So I did that by putting these little shadows in the backs of the cards. So small, medium and large shadows. Um, and they they relate directly to a range of values. So like a small at depth one would be between zero and two. And then a medium would be two to one to three. So you, you know vaguely what you're going to need to pay in dice to catch the thing. But instead of literally putting those values on the back of the card, because you could easily just print one to three on the back of the card, you know, or so you can look at it large or go, something I know like what that. that's going to cost, but I wanted people to feel clever. Um, I like, I like things that make you feel clever and I like things that make you feel like you're kind of doing research before you make a decision on something. So there's a little player guide that, that shows you what the values of different shadow sizes are. So you have to look at it and you have to reference the guide to determine what the range of shadows is. That's that's good friction is what I like to call that. Um, it's like creating a little bit of friction that slows people down and makes them make better informed decisions. And I, I, I'm very proud of that. I thought that was cool. Yeah, I think we're both big fans, aren't we? Because every time someone, we've had a few people ask about this game because we've demoed it. And I think one of the first things I bring up is the, the shadows on the back of the card because you could have easily just had... A, uh, shallow depths you've got zero to five but giving you that idea that this is a small fish this is a medium fish and that this thins down the value certainly kind of makes it more of a choice where you have decision space to make yeah. and and it could be that uh, uh, medium depth you've just got all large fish at that depth right showing from the shadows and you might be like well i'm going to miss that and i'll go to the full depth or i'll stay in the shallows until someone decides to catch those bigger fish or whatever or they go away for the day after the day or something so i'm glad you brought that up because i think myself and davey and a few others on the podcast have have talked about how great we like that design choice so i'm glad you've brought that up a little bit of a luck mitigation as well which is always nice like it's nice to have these random elements, but then to have a choice or to at least have a little bit of knowledge before you go in, before you make that decision, I think is a really good design space. Yeah, that's, I know you were talking about like design um, mentality. And another thing that's important to me is luck. Like it's weird to say that a lot of people are like very Euro in their mindset for design where they want something to be 
entirely like 100% player agency where you can come into it and you can always have a competitive game. But I heard a really good quote from um, Richard Garfield, the guy that did Magic the Gathering back in the day uh, recently where he was talking about luck in games. And he said, like, luck is important because in a game that is 100% strategy like chess, you have a difficult time finding someone who will give you a good game. If you're really good at chess, you can't just sit down and play with anyone because if they're not good at the game, you're not going to have a good time. You won't be challenged properly. Whereas introducing luck into a game kind of levels the playing field a little bit. And I think it's a really cool philosophy and it ties into magic really well because you never know what you're going to draw and your, you know, your game is very dependent on whether you get the lands you need, that kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I come from, from a design perspective is I like a lot of luck in games. And then I try and find ways to, like you said, mitigate that luck. So you can make decisions that, give you the, the the best possible chances like um, quacks of quedlinburg buy good things to put in your bag to try and mitigate the chance that your your thing blows up but ultimately you can't really control it. i love that game that's a good game i, I do think that balance is important though because if something's too leans too far on the luck side it can have very fit like feel bad moments you go in thinking oh yeah I, i'm i've definitely got this and then suddenly you can't do anything yeah, another thing um, that Elizabeth Hargrave said about designing Wingspan was that she noticed a lot of people in playtesting just liked making a little display of birds. They liked the tableau building aspect of it and did not care whether they won. They had a good time regardless of whether they got good birds or not. And, and that's another thing I found really inspiring is like, it, I want the game to feel fun whether you whether you you know did horribly or whether you did great, which is why I like the madness mechanic because if you lose, it's almost more fun. Like if you're the one who had the most madness, that's kind of a fun thing, right? You're like, oh, I'm a totally crazy. I lost this fish. You don't feel bad about that. It's a fun thing. You get to, you still get to take something away. You, you take away the, <laughs> the pride of being the craziest person at the table. So you've kind of explained um, the mechanics of it. Is there any player interaction that goes on with the game? Uh, there is. Um, in th- there's kind of there's minimal player interaction from like a direct perspective where there's a few cards that you can like give to other players or that force other players to discard regrets that kind of thing um that they're kind of sprinkled throughout there's not a lot of them and then like the big bit of player interaction is kind of the meta game which is critical uh and it ties back to the the regrets and madness that we talked about earlier because you have to watch where people are fishing because it can affect you. Like if people are, if everybody's fishing at the lower depth, they're going to be turning over a lot of fish that give all players regrets and that's going to drive your madness up. You're going to be sucked into this world of madness whether you want to or not. So if you're trying to play a safe game and stay at the higher depths and get, you know, cheaper fish, it's going to affect the value of your fish where they're fishing. So there's kind of, and if everybody's fishing at a really high depth and you're the only one low, you're running the risk of being the only crazy one and, and losing when you're uh, knowing that you're going to lose your most valuable fish when everyone else is going to do pretty well. So there's this interesting, like, like, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly eye shifty meme thing where everyone's looking at everyone else to see what they're doing and determining with, whether they're going to make the first move or not. We also quite enjoyed the mechanic where if you run out of regrets in the deck, then we start taking each other's regrets. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's some very late game player interaction there. Yeah. Which ended up in its own little meta game in itself of, uh, <laughs> whose regrets are you going to take who's been getting rid of their low value uh, their high values and who's still yeah. got their low values in there yeah yeah i tried to like there were, in places where there was um player interaction i tried to make it not too take thatty because it's such there is so much luck and randomization in the game if you introduce a lot of negative effects like that it's going to start to feel degrading to play you're not going to enjoy it so like most of the player interaction tends to be things like do the life preserver at the start of the round, whoever rolled the highest gets to give this life preserver to someone else. So they are choosing who they think is most deserving of it. So it's a player interaction and you can try to curry their favor and get it, but generally they're going to make the decision based on who they think needs it the most or who they think is doing the worst. Same thing with the regrets. They'll take the regrets if all the, you know, so the mechanic there is that if the draw pile and the discard pile of regrets are, are empty, you have to pick another player and take a regret from them instead. So you're, going to try and make strategic decisions about who you think it would would benefit the least from losing a regret basically <laughs> yeah 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 everyone salted their breakfast that morning <laughs> <laughs> is this your first kickstarter campaign this is my third kickstarter campaign so i've done two kickstarter campaigns for the same game in two editions so i did a previous game i did called hideous abomination which is about it's like a family-friendly monster builder 
Um, and I did a first and second edition of that on Kickstarter first. That's an add-on currently, isn't it? On Deep Regrets as well. Yeah, yeah so you, you can, can get still... that. I'm really proud of that game. Like it doesn't get as much attention because people assume, I think it's maybe the primary colors of it. They assume it's just for kids and it is family friendly, but I have never met a person that sat down and played that game that didn't love it. I'm also very proud of that game. Deep Regrets is great, but I don't want people to forget about Hideous Abomination. It's a good game. So do you feel like you've learned a lot from your first campaign over to this one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every campaign has been kind of like a, a fail forward situation. You know, they, they were both successful, but like the first one was only just barely successful and it did everything wrong and it learned a lot from it. And the second one was successful, but it wasn't near what I wanted it to be. You know, like it was it was barely enough to like live on and make this game. And this one, this one is already doing well enough that I can pay myself a salary and then have operating funds to continue making games without having to, you know, scrimp, beg, and save in the future, which would be great. That's the, nice. That's the good end goal. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask, is one of the things you learned the video that's gone with Deep Regrets? Because I think it's fair to say it's getting a lot of love at the moment. And I'm, I'm, I have to put my hand up and say I'm one of these people that normally skip the video at the top. And I did when I first opened Deep Regrets. And then I saw on social media several people talking about the video for that. And people really getting quite excited for for kind of what was involved in that video. So is that what was the process of producing that video and deciding to go in that direction? So I mean, I've done that every time. Like if you go back and watch Hideous Abomination One, it's like in the style of a like '80s gross out advertisement. Like there was there's a product in the U.S. called Creepy Crawlers back in the '90s, like early '90s, where you like got this goop and pressed these little worms out of it. And it was, you know, like a mad scientist in his lab making these things in the commercials. And that's exactly what I was going for. And I did the same thing for the second one. It was like a, a sequel commercial, basically. And I just have a blast doing that. Like I like, I, I don't, I feel like um, you get all these like really polished, beautiful 3D rendered videos people put up where like the cards are like magically lifting up and flipping over and meeples are, you know, sorry, I'm not allowed to say meeples anymore. <laughs> uh, the wooden people figures are moving around on their own um and they, they look great but they feel so inhuman to me especially in a space like board games where we're talking about sitting around playing things with people in person i want it to feel tactile i want it to have actual people in there so they're quite I, I'll, soulless, I'll, aren't they yeah, yeah. I, so I'll, I'll probably always do these live action things but then i also you know I'm an auteur. I want to do these little, <laughs> it's like an excuse for to make a short film basically and force, force thousands of people to watch it whether they want to or not. It's like a horror Wes Anderson style. That's <laughs> what I liked about it. <laughs> yeah. I never thought of the Wes Anderson thing. Somebody, somebody mentioned that on the YouTube thing and, and they're absolutely right. It's all the like zero point perspective, you know, the life aquatic. Yeah. Moving. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, no camera movements, all like center frame stuff. Yeah. I enjoyed that video. And I, I was in the same boat as Adrian where I don't normally watch the board game videos. And it's probably because they are quite soulless. But for me, it was quite refreshing watching that video. It's all kind of part of the theming, you know, like a lot of times you pick up a game and the only really theming you get is from the box itself. And what the what the little board, there's usually a little paragraph at the start of the, of the instruction manual that kind of casts and, and you might get some flavor text that builds the world a little bit. But I, I look at the Kickstarter and all the marketing as an opportunity to build on that theming. like. That trailer helps flesh out the story a little bit for it. So if you didn't watch that, you may not have like the full picture. Kind of reminds me of, okay, I'm going to go back to the Soulsborne world here. I'm playing Elden Ring and the DLC at the moment. And it's good. They, all of their trailers will have like story bits in it that do not appear in the game at all. And people are really obsessed with the lore of those games. So you have to have watched the trailer and played the game to get the full story. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. It's a unique way to tell a story. Definitely. And a lot of the... Elden Ring games. I mean, a lot of it I've had to read up. Yeah. Aside from the even playing the game, <laughs> I'm just like, I need, to, I need more. Beat this boss. Yeah. 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 So obviously, we saw you at UK Games Expo this year, yep. and one of the things I was kind of fascinated to know about is, was it like a hard deadline for you to get prototypes and that ready for the expo? Did you just hit a point in production where you were like, you know what, this is ready to go, and I'm an expo's coming up, let's book in for a stall there, kind of. What was your thought process on getting it ready to to be viewed by the public? So it was um, not just UK Games Expo. So that that's important, but there's also that community aspect as well, getting it round to people to play test and to review and things like that. And I want them to have the experience of, of playing a more or less finished game. Um, 
So the prototype that you played has, even at the time of UK Games Expo, had already changed quite a bit. I kind of, there was like a, a point at which I was like, if I'm going, you know, this is my tentative date for Kickstarter. If I'm going to go then, I need to figure out how far in advance I want to start sending this around to people. And I need to go ahead and produce it now. So I kind of pulled the trigger knowing it wasn't complete yet, knowing it, but, but knowing that it was far enough along that I felt like it was a um, reasonable representation of the gameplay that I was proud enough to put in front of reviewers and previewers and all that stuff. So I, I made that decision maybe in... January or February, I think, with UK Games Expo being in, when was it? June? Started first first weekend of June. Um, what is time anymore? Yeah, I know <laughs> what you mean. It's the uh, 17th, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yes, 17th of June, yes, yeah, according yeah. to your invite. Uh, so I, it was actually delayed by the manufacturer as well. They got overwhelmed. So I, I had my manufacturer, What's Games, they built the prototype for me. And it was meant to be a six-week turnaround. It wound up being about a, like a 12-week turnaround. So I didn't get it in front of quite as many reviewers and previewers as I would have liked to before the Kickstarter started off. But I had it in time, just in time for UK Games Expo. It came in literally the week before. Ooh. I was planning to roll in with my little hand-built one for a minute there. And like it showed up in the mail. I was like, yes! This is this train. I got it in the post to reviewers the, right before I left for UK Game Expo. Actually, no, I didn't. That's not true. I sent it off as soon as I got back. Nice. So yeah, so you were all prepped, but... That's close deadline then if you got it only a week beforehand. That must have yeah. been quite nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I planned it out really well and you know, I didn't I didn't build in time for delays, which I absolutely should have. Nice. It worked in the end. Yep. And being yeah, able to play right. one of the I copies was there. one of my one of my highlights of the weekend. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. For me too, yeah. I think if anyone goes back and listens to our expo episode, they'll hear the I think the amount of fun we had in that in that demo and definitely definitely stood out to both of us so hence why we wanted to talk to you on the podcast so i did want to ask you about some board games because we usually do this before but oh, yeah. kind of naturally went on to deep regrets so i thought we wouldn't stop the flow and i'd ask you <laughs> um what's your what's your current game that you're playing at the moment board game wise um so I just posted about this on the the first update. I'm playing a lot of Terrorscape at the moment because a buddy of mine went all in on the last Kickstarter and they're they're going to their second one at the moment. Um, but I'll say something else because I just posted about on the um, Kickstarter update. So also playing them, I just picked up Septima, which I'm very excited about. I've only had a chance to play it once, but I love Mind Clash games. Also a big inspiration to me. Um, I played Tricarian seven years ago or whenever it came out and it just blew me away. Have you played Tricarian? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I played it again Sunday. Like that is a, a meaty game I, and like the theming like flows so well with it. And Septima is, is similar in tone. I only played it once and there's like a um, a basic setup and an advanced setup. So I haven't done the advanced setup yet, but I'm excited to get it back on the table so I can check that out. It's about um, you're like witches that are brewing potions to save the villagers in the town, but, you know, avoid the wrath of the witch hunters that are out there. They don't like you. You're, you're good witches. Yes. You are yeah, good you're, witches. You're, you're misunderstood. People. Yeah, misunderstood witches. That's a good, yeah. <laughs> good shot. <job. laughs> um, yeah, the the shape shifting expansion to that, or uh, well, the module to that, is really good as well. Ooh, kind of it, it narrows the, your choice space a little bit because you have to play a card to get all your other cards back. So mm, it, okay. it's quite. It makes it an interesting puzzle once you've got the basic game down. I've seen that, but I haven't. Um, I want to play the regular game a few times before I move on to the modules and expansions. Nice. No, so we're, we're big lovers of Mind Crash games. Yeah, yeah. Any of our regular listeners will have heard about September before, I'm sure. So, because yeah. um, uh, both JP and Becky sort of went through a bit of a loop, didn't they, of kind of buying it and getting it and playing it. So they both talked about their experience on playing that that game of September. Favorite board game. Favorite board game of yeah. all time. Of all time. Of all time. Um, You're trapped in a room. That's the only game you can play. <laughs> I already talked about Tricarian and Wingspan, both of which are in the running for that. I'm trying to, so I would probably say one of those two, but I'll say something else. Let me see if I can think of a third favorite board game. Um, I flit around so much, <laughs> so indecisive, and I like trying new things. So it's usually whatever I've just played. Um, but ones that come to mind as old favorites, you know what I'm going to say? Recent favorite fit to print. Oh um, which is, have you played that one? It's, no. um, oh, I forget the name of the company. Um, the same folks that do, uh, Cascadia. 
and oh. uh, and Calico and Calico. all those games. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's a game where you're putting together a newspaper. You're like an editor for a newspaper. So you're collecting articles and putting them together. And it's like all done in real time. So you have exactly like three minutes or four minutes or however, whatever difficulty you decide to set to pick all the articles you want and put them into your page for the day. And you're trying to like meet certain requirements and certain things can't sit next to one another. And at the end of it, you you proof each other's work basically to make sure you put things in the correct places. And it's just great. It's, it's amazing chaos. I love it. Oh, nice. Nice. That sounds that sounds interesting. I'll, I want to give that a go now because yeah, I hadn't seen that one. <laughs> I've, um, Cascadia's been on the top of my to playlist for a little while now. So um, Cascadia, I like, but I think of their games, Fit to Print is my favorite so far. There you go. I think I saw that at the expo. If I'm not mistaken, but maybe not. Yeah, it's not. It's not been on my radar. No, I think I, I think I walked past it. But yeah, interesting. It's, it sounds unique, which is always nice. Yeah, yeah, it's good things. Going back to your games, it's, it's what stood out for me at the expo. Is it is a unique game, and you obviously struggled with trying to define its mechanics. <laughs> That's the reason why is a, we haven't really played anything like it. Uh, have, you, have you got anything else coming up in the design space? Um, well, I, I've got you know a few things on the back burner that I'm working on. I, I have one game that I'm working on forever. That was the first game I started working on called Fright House. That's about building and running your own like haunted attraction which was born out of my youth spent building and running haunted houses for trick-or-treaters in my hometown for like geysers. Um, and it's just kind of, a, I, I, I played Tricarian and I was like, I'm going to design a board game. And I was like, I'll make a thing like Tricarian, not understanding the, the amount of complexity that was required to, to do something like that. Um, and it just, it's, you know, it's a behemoth that needs to be scrapped and started from fresh. I want to, I still want to make it cause it's close to my heart, but I don't, it's like mostly done and it's awful. It's, it's either too long or not fun, you know, and everything I do to change it pushes it one way or the other. Um, the synopsis, it kind of reminded me a bit of like Boss Monster, but yes, with its yeah, own. That's a, good, that's a good point of reference. So there is a good one to compare that to. Yeah, yeah. Except you're trying to, you're like deciding what, what guests, the guests have like phobias at the moment. So there's like four different genres, like slasher and spooky and occult. And they, as they go through the rooms you've built, if it matches their phobia, their fears goes up. Like a little, it's like a little uh, hero clicks type base that that tracks their fear. And if their fear gets too high, they can die. And then you have to like pay to refrigerate them. So the cops, <laughs> like thematically, I love it. I just yeah. can't make it work. It's just too long. So I'll come back to it eventually. But I've got another thing brewing that's I don't want to announce yet because it's very very early in its infancy. There you go. Makes Watch sense. this space. Well, hopefully, look forward to Fright House at some point. That does sound like yeah. an amazing concept. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so I think we're good to move on to um, some niche number ones. Let's do Adrian's it. Adrian's got a couple to ask. I have. So for those of – it's been quite a while since we've done niche number – we normally do them as episodes, and then we pick a couple from the most recent episode, and uh, we ask our guests uh, a few of them, and they can be a bit bit odd and a bit crazy and sort of makes you think outside the box a little bit. So for those who haven't heard of, uh, of our niche number one segment, what we do is we come up with very niche topics – and then we ask you, what is your favorite board game in that niche topic? Um, and I've tried not to go too left field on this. I've tried to keep them not quite as niche as we always do. But um, I enjoy a challenge. Bring it yeah. on. <laughs> so the one that I've got to start off with is, what is your favorite game that you never win? Most of them. <laughs> Terrible at <laughs> games. Like, I hear this from a lot of game designers. We're not good at games. We just like games and like making them. Um, I never win... Hmm. Moon. Really enjoy Moon, but I cannot win Moon. I just like the this the strategy of it eludes me. I don't know what it is about it, but I love playing it. It's great. Yeah, we just played it recently, didn't we? And it's there's we definitely did, yeah. there's a few Beautiful options too, to it, but yeah, it, I can understand that kind of not feeling locked out, but sometimes kind of struggling to see how you're gonna get all your victory points at the end kind of coming yeah. together and all it takes is one card to do it. But but, yeah. but it's another one where it doesn't really matter. Like I, you know, you're doing something cool and you've got your own thing going on and you're working towards it and it feels good whether you've won or lost. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I thought I was doing really well and then I ended up losing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, okay, so we'll move on to the next one. So what is your favorite game that the rest of your gaming group hates? Oh, um, hmm, that's a good question. What if I only gotten people to play once and then they've never wanted to go? Yeah, back? that's that's kind <laughs> of the know, thinking. I, 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 I'm not going to cheat. I was going to look at my Tabletopia backlog. Um, I've got a bit of a, a weird one. 
that my wife and I really like playing, but I'm not sure anybody else really does. And it's the Haunted Mansion Call of the Spirits board game, it, which is, is not very well known, I don't think. Um, Weirdly, we and, had, um, I think it was, we had another developer on who also mentioned this board game because I had never heard of it before. It's It, it, it wasn't available in the UK for a while. It's it's like a big, um, um, what, what's his name? The... Funko released it. So it's a big thing and it's Disney, you know, they're behind it. It just came out a couple of years ago. So it's, it's a big production and it's very well made. Um, but it, I don't think it's big in the UK. I don't think it really made it over here very much. But I picked it up when I was in the U S and brought it back. So I, was, I love haunted mansion. That's like my whole aesthetics. Car- cartoonishly spooky is where I live. <laughs> so I, I, you, you're like, it has a similar mechanic to um, deep regrets, the regret thing. So I pulled that kind of concept from both it and another game called don't go in there which is like Call of the Spirits, but in the reverse. And I'm not sure which one copied the other. I have to assume that Disney stole the idea from Don't Go In There <laughs> and didn't credit them for it. Both are very cool games. You should look up Don't Go In There as well. Um, but you're like, it's their, their set collection. You're like collecting different ghosts or different cursed things. And if you have you know, different sets, they're worth different things. Um, and But you're collecting like haunt cards over the course of the game. And whoever has the most haunt cards at the end loses. Um, can't can't win at all. It's just like a, a devastating law. Or they they lose their their biggest set. Um, and don't we're in, in there is the opposite, where you're trying to have the fewest points. You're trying not to have sets of things, which is a really cool mechanic. It's like the opposite of a um, of a set. It's like a set don't collector. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is an that is an odd sales pitch. If you told me that was your sales pitch for the game, is I want you not to collect sets of things. I would probably be like, mm, sure. But yeah, yeah it sounds like one worth checking out. Yeah, I have to take a look into that. And then finally, what is your favorite game to lure non gamers to play a game? Ooh, I got to I mean, Wingspan works really well, but I'm not going to use that one again. I'm going to, I'm going to try to pick something different here. Um, gentle, a gentle rain. Have you played a gentle rain? It's a, it's like a solo or co op type game um, where you're just placing tiles, basically. You're drawing and placing tiles like Carcassonne style. Um, And if if you link up the flowers on the tiles, you get to place a little thing in the middle of it and you're just trying to get rid of as many tiles as possible. And it's meant to be a Zen experience. And it just, it appeals to people. The name itself puts you in a kind of a Zen state of mind. So when you come to it, um, you're expecting to be calmed by it. And it's a very calming, beautiful game. And they've just come out with a new edition of it as well. Um, So that's one, that's one to check out. If you're looking for like a nice little, very quick solo game, that's a Zen experience. Highly recommend. I'd have to put some rainforest noises in the background while we play. (laughs) Yeah. It's one I had seen before, but I love tile placement games. So like a good portion of my collection is already tile placement. And I've looked at it and thought, nah, I can't, I can't add another one to my collection just yet. So I recommend it. Good. Real. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Judson. Um, so the Kickstarter campaign, uh, campaign is currently um, in progress. Um, when does it end? So it's wrapping up on the twenty fourth of July. Oh, don't don't ask me right now. I don't. I'm, <laughs> I'm too frazzled Around. from the whole thing. It, it's it's <laughs> the last week of July. I think it's the Thursday of the last week of July. Whatever that is. Okay. Uh, the 25th the 25th 25th of July. there we are it's, it's the close uh, Davey, it's the 25th of July <laughs> yeah well thank you very much for coming on um it's been great to hear about deep regrets and everything you've been up to thank you very much for having me it's been it's been great chatting with you guys There we have it, Judson from Deep Regrets. It's been a great pleasure having him on the show. It's another expansion episode down. If you want to contact us, get in hold of us, get some questions out to the developers, you can find us in our socials below. And as always, uh, who, whose turn is it anyway? 